Why, hello, fellow Patriots, and welcome to episode 21 on the Patriot Dad channel, where we can discuss current events and modern issues, all while keeping it as real as possible. Today, we're kicking off our series on the U.S. Constitution with a look at Article 1. Stop and throw a comment below what your guess on the purpose of Article 1 is. Be nice to each other in the comments, though. We all started somewhere with our level of knowledge, and, and we're here to up our game and inform ourselves, so be nice to each other. Throw a guess down there. Don't worry if you're right or wrong. See if you're right or wrong in the end. As we dive in, remember also that parts of the Constitution have been amended over the years, and therefore our first look at the document may seem wrong or incorrect to how we do business today, but that's just the original writing. Let's dive into this wonderful document, shall we? Say, if you had guessed that it's laying the groundwork for and setting up our legislative branch of government, you would be correct. Article 1 has 10 sections, each has its own job, whether it is an introduction, like Section 1, or which part of the legislative branch it forms and directs their duties, like in Section 8. So we'll start off looking at Section 1. All legislative powers herein granted shall be vested in a Congress of the United States, which shall consist of a Senate and a House of Representatives. So right out the gate, Article 1, Section 1 clearly delineates that our legislative branch is going to be comprised of a Senate and a House of Representatives. So that's pretty simple, cut and dry, right? We do still only have two parts of the legislative branch, but how they're elected and some of the other ways that they do their business have changed due to amendments over time. Section 2 of Article 1 says the House of Representatives, so Section 2 right out the gate, we're setting up the House of Representatives, shall be comprised of members chosen every second year, so here we're setting up their election cycles, by people of the several states, and the electors in each state shall have qualifications requisite for electors of the most numerous branch of the state legislature. No person shall be a representative who shall not have attained the age of 25 and been seven years a citizen of the United States, and whom shall not, when elected, be an inhabitant of the state in which he shall be chosen. So you can see right here, we are setting up our requirements for running for office you must be 25 years of age and you must have been a U.S. citizen for seven years. Okay, when vacancies happen, so if somebody dies, if somebody quits, if there's a vacancy, section two also clearly states here that when vacancies happen and the representation from any state, the executive authority thereof shall issue writs of election to fill such vacancies. The House of Representatives shall choose their speaker and each other's officers and shall have the sole power of impeachment. So we can see here that, you know, we fill vacancies as such, but also that the House of Representatives itself is going to choose its own officers and the speaker. So the speaker elections will be conducted by members of the House itself. And the House of Representatives has the sole power to impeach. That's important to know going forward. Section three, we see here that the Senate of the United States shall be composed of two senators from each state chosen by the legislature thereof for six years and each senator shall have one vote. So this has changed as well. We no longer choose our senators by the state legislature. They are also elected like our representatives of the House. No person shall be a senator who has not attained the age of 30 years old and nine years a citizen of the U.S. So we see here there are different requirements for being a senator as there are for being a representative in the House. And they are clearly laid out for us here in Section 3. The Vice President of the United States shall preside of the Senate, but shall have no vote unless they be equally divided. So we do have 50 states, two senators per state. So there could be a direct 50-50 tie. So here, section three clearly lays out to us that if there is a 50-50 tie in the Senate, who's responsible to break the tie? That would be the Vice President of the United States. So while that office does seem ceremonial at times and not really that important, in a time of a divided Congress, if we have a 50-50 split, that could be an extremely important office to control. Also, the Senate shall have the sole power to try all impeachments. So the House has the sole power to impeach, but the Senate conducts the trial is important. When the President of the United States is tried, which we have seen here recently, the Chief Justice shall preside, and no persons shall be convicted without the concurrence of two-thirds of the members present. Now notice it's members present. That does not mean all members. If there are a bunch of people missing and they have the vote, you could end up with two-thirds with far fewer votes. 
Judgment in cases of impeachment shall not extend further than removal from office, any disqualification to hold and enjoy any office of honor, trust, or profit under the United States, but the party convicted shall nevertheless be liable and subject to indictment, trial, judgment, and punishment according to the law. So section three is pretty important. Now we have the Senate. Section four, the times, places, manner, and holding of elections for senators and representatives shall be prescribed in each state by the legislature thereof, but the Congress may at any time by law make or alter such regulations except as to the place of choosing senators. So here it is clearly laid out in section four that the federal government leaves the control of each state's elections to the state themselves. So that is critical. And we've seen the results of that in the last few elections. There's a lot of complaints back and forth from either side about how each state may or may not have run it well or effectively. But you know what? Section four of article one clearly states that each state is responsible to run its own elections. Section five, each house shall be the judge of the elections, returns, and quality qualifications of its own members, and a majority of each shall constitute a quorum to do business, but a smaller number may adjourn from day to day and may be authorized to compel the attendance of absent members in such manner under such penalties as the House may provide. Each House may determine rules of its proceedings, punish its members for disorderly behavior, and with the concurrence of two-thirds, expel a member. So here you can see each of the chambers is responsible for making its own rules and behavior restrictions. And with enough people, if someone gets really crazy or out of control, you can expel a member of Congress. The House or the Senate is responsible for doing that and self-policing. Another interesting fact here at the end of Section 5 is that neither House during the session of Congress shall without the consent of the other adjourn for more than three days, nor to any place than that in which the two Houses shall be sitting. So you can't just have the House decide we're done with our business for the year, we're going home without the permission of the Senate. If they're still conducting business, each of the houses can keep the other one present. And if they try and hold their meeting somewhere else, they can be compelled to return to the Capitol building. Interesting. Section six talks about their compensation. Also, at the second part here, you see that no senator or representative shall, during the time in which they were elected, be appointed to any civil office under the authority of the United States. This restriction is to prevent them from holding multiple federal offices. If you are a member of the House or the Senate, you are restricted from holding a separate office. Section seven, you see here that all bills raising revenue shall originate with the House of Representatives, but the Senate may propose or concur with amendments as on other bills. So any bill that involves spending or money originates in the House of Representatives. Every order, resolution, or vote to which concurrence of the Senate and House of Representatives may be necessary, except for the question of adjournment, shall be presented to the President of the United States, and before the same shall take effect, shall be approved by him or her president, or on being disproved by him, possibly her in the future, shall be repassed by two thirds of the Senate or House. So this is where the veto override authority comes from here in section seven of article one. The real meat and potatoes of article one though is section eight. You can see here that the Congress shall have power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, and excises to pay debts and provide for the common defense and the general welfare of the United States. But all duties, imposts, and excises shall be uniform throughout the states. So here there's federal control of taxes, but they cannot say that taxes will be higher in one state versus another. They must be uniform. Also gives Congress the power to borrow money on credit for the United States, to regulate commerce with foreign nations and between states, so the commerce clause that gets referred to quite a bit, to establish the rules of naturalization, to establish rules of bankruptcy, to coin money, to regulate the value of money, to provide for the punishment for counterfeiting money, to establish the post office, to define and punish piracies and felonies committed on the high seas and offenses against the laws of nations, to declare war, grant letters of marquee and reprisal, and to make rules concerning the captures on land and water, to raise and support armies. But interestingly enough, no appropriation of money to the use shall be for longer than two years. We were never supposed to have a long-term standing army. However, because the Navy is a little bit different and building ships, maintaining ships is a longer term prospect clearly laid out here in section 8 to provide and maintain a navy is one of the things that congress is responsible for to make rules for the government 
and regulation of the land and naval forces to provide for calling forth the militia to execute the laws of the Union to suppress insurrections and repel invasions. So again, not a permanent army, the militia. So you can see here that Section 8 is really the meat and potatoes. It clearly defines what Congress is supposed to be doing. Now, Section 9, you have the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus shall not be suspended unless when in the case of rebellion or invasion, the public safety may require it. What is the writ of habeas corpus, you might ask? Although the Constitution does not specifically create the right to habeas corpus relief, federal statutes provide federal courts with the authority to grant habeas relief to state prisoners. Only Congress has the power to suspend the writ of habeas corpus, either by its own affirmative actions or through the express delegation to the executive. The executive does not have the independent authority on its own to suspend the writ. Also in section nine, kind of harking back to where we came from before we formed our country, is that they wanted to avoid some of the nobility and aristocracy here in these United States. So the Congress has a restriction that no title of nobility shall shall be granted by the United States, period. No person holding any office of profit or trust under them shall, without the consent of Congress, accept of any present emolument, office, or title of any kind, whatever, from any king, prince, or foreign state. So if you are, so if you hold a federal office, you cannot accept a title or any other promotion or elevation from a foreign ruler. Interesting, it's a nice little restriction though, it keeps us from having lords any more than we already do. Section 10 clearly lays out the process of treaties. States can't have their own money anymore. They can't borrow their own money and have credit independently of the federal government. No state can lay duties or impose taxes on its imports and exports, except very minimally that is required to perform inspections. And lastly, no state shall, without the consent of Congress, lay any duty of tonnage, keep troops or ships of war in time of peace, enter into any agreement or compact with any state, foreign power, or engage in war unless actually invaded or in such imminent danger as to not admit of delay. So that's the end of Article 1. Now, interestingly enough, that last restriction on war, actually, I wonder with us being invaded from across our border, if that would give Texas or Arizona or California, it would give it the ability to declare war on its own because they are being invaded. I think that's why they've been fighting against having people actually declare and use the word invasion. Instead, it's an immigration problem. We'll see. Thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please give it a thumbs up leave a comment below if you would like to see more videos like this please subscribe to the channel hit the little bell icon so you can be notified when i upload new content please share the video with anyone you choose whether it's friends family church members co-workers or whomever you choose leave a comment recommending a future topic if you will following today's topic next week for next weekend's release, we will be digging into Article 2 of the Constitution. What do you think that one's for? We're also going to probably be doing another midweek release of a music reaction. I hope you're enjoying those. I enjoy making them. Let me know what you think in the comments. Take care, everyone. God bless. And bye for now. Go ahead and check out one of the links on the screen now to either subscribe to the channel and see the rest of the videos of the channel or one of the carefully selected videos that you may wish to see that YouTube has used its algorithm to select for you.